Hi guys, I'm Kat. And I'm Emma. And thank you for joining us once again. Welcome back to the Dead Parent Club podcast. Each week we're going to be talking about what it's like to be members of the Dead Parent Club and also chatting to brilliant guests about their grieving journeys. We'll also be hearing from people far more qualified than us that can give you some top advice on navigating this new normal. So welcome to the Dead Parent Club. Now, this week we are joined by journalist, presenter and producer Steve Bland, the husband of the late Rachel Bland from the podcast You, Me and the Big C, which I'm sure a lot of you have listened to. Yeah, we're going to be talking to Steve about his grieving journey and how he supported his son through his grief. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Thank you very much for Thank having me. Thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. Oh, don't be silly. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Steve. Um, and like Kat says, it is a genuine pleasure to have you on. I guess the starting point is, if it's all right with you, I know you shared your story a lot and it's helped a lot of people. But for anyone listening to this right now who doesn't know your story, um, can you please tell us? Yeah, well, how long have we got? Um, uh, so, yeah, so my uh, my wife, Rachel, uh, Rachel Bland, was a BBC uh, presenter. She worked at BBC Radio 5 Live and occasionally on the BBC News Channel. Um, and up here in the north, in the northwest of England, she was on uh, uh, local telly and things as well. But, uh, but 5 Live is really where people would know her best from. Uh, she read the news and she presented the Drive, uh, Drive program as well. And uh, in 2016, she got breast cancer and uh, we'd been married for only two or three years at the time. Uh, we had a 14 month old son and that's the kind of start of, of, of it all going a little mm. bit wrong. You know, for the next two years, we were in and out of hospital, uh, lots of different treatment, lots of operations, lots of surgery um, and uh, nothing really seemed to work. And in, in, in September of uh, 2018, uh, Rachel unfortunately died. Uh, from her yeah triple negative breast cancer and um uh but you know going back to the podcast you mentioned before uh, b- uh before she uh, before she died about a year before she died she started a, a a podcast at five live called you me and the big c which was you know which was really doing a similar thing to you know what you guys are trying to do with grief and and and, and you know that kind of thing it was it was breaking down the taboos it was having the awkward conversations it was making people you know, going uh, going uh, through that journey, you know, uh, feel a bit less alone. And, you know, at the time, this is going back to, you know, 2017 or 2017, 2018. At the time, people weren't really talking mm. about cancer in the way that they did. And 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 you, you look at now the kind of uh, what, uh, what we kind of call the cancer community mm. on Instagram and on social media, you know, it's massive. People are sharing their stories left, right and centre. Uh, young people, young women particularly sharing their stories of, of everything, you know, warts and all, but back then it wasn't really happening. And 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 Rachel and Deborah and Lauren, who who she started the podcast with, you know, were kind of trailblazers in that in that respect. And uh, after she died, we were, you know, we were determined that the podcast would carry on. It was never really the plan that I would I would carry it on, but I did one with the girls, uh, and and it just kind of worked. And we, you know, we cracked on. And and it's been a, you know, it's been a massive. I mean, you guys will know it's, you know, being able to talk about it like this, you know, every week. You know, having you know really honest conversations with amazing people, you know, you learn a lot, but you also you also kind of process it yourself mm-hmm. a little bit as well, and and it's become kind of my, you know, my therapy over the last two or three years as uh, as uh, doing that podcast. So yeah, um, and 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 since she died, it's it's been nearly two and a half years now since she died. I've I've kind of spent my time mm-hmm. talking about her all the time, and and you know, and it's and it's nothing that I've done. It's all. You know, it's all all what she did, and the kind of the work she did, and the legacy that she's left, and 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 the impact that she made on people. Um, you know, that's the reason pe- uh, people want to talk to me. So it's been a roller coaster over the last few years. What was it like? Because obviously, you said you had a fourteen month old. You know, when Rachel first got her diagnosis and that journey through her battle with cancer, what was that like for you and for her? Um, you know, interesting use of the word battle. She was a real, I uh, did not like the word battle at all. And um, she, uh, she really didn't like it because, uh, to her, I remember a piece that was written after, after she died in one of the papers in the Guardian, I think it was. And it, 
and it said don't uh, don't say that Rachel Bland lost her battle because that kind of gives the impression of this kind of injured soldier mm. trudging off the battlefield having kind of done everything they could but they lost you know and and to me you know she didn't lose anything you know we tried everything we possibly could it was you know there was nothing that we could do it was it was you know beyond our our, our control and and um you know i was getting messages from people all, all over the world from brazil and from germany and from the you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the us and from literally all corners of the globe saying what an impact she'd had and i just i thought to myself that's you know if that's if that's losing anything you know i'll i'll take that every day of the week so um but yeah sorry going back to your question it it, it was um it was it was a it was a strange one people uh, talk about that kind of you've been hit by a bus kind of moment when you told you had cancer and it was a it, it was a funny thing for uh, for me I, I didn't really feel that because i'm i'm quite a you know kind of positive uh, kind of person so my first thought was right trying to get Rachel into kind of that positive frame of mind you know we'll map out the chemo and we'll just we'll say right we're starting around around about Christmas we had uh, we actually started in between Christmas and, and New Year um it was it was a it was a really difficult time because she wanted to go um uh, do some IVF before to preserve mm. her embryos uh, because obviously chemo uh, 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 her can affect you know the chance of mm. having more kids so uh, we did you know, two weeks before Christmas, um, all the injections, uh, bo- seven o'clock on Boxing Day morning, harvesting wow. eggs in a clinic wow. in Manchester. And then three days later, uh, she started chemo. And I was just all about, you know, uh, th- uh, uh, thinking about the things that we could affect, you know, thinking about um, uh, keeping her positive, uh, keeping her like looking forward. You know, we mapped out, right, we're going to have this chemo, then some surgery, and then and then this. And then, you know, by, say, July, August time, we'll be done. And that hopefully mm-hmm. will be the end of it. And that's that's very much kind of how I was thinking. And and I can remember saying to her, um, you know, we'll go into hospital, have your treatment. And in between treatments, we won't even talk about it. You know, you know we won't let uh, cancer dominate our lives at all. It won't, you know, it won't, you know, we can't let that happen. But actually, the reality is a lot different to that, you know. You know, within a couple of weeks, you realise that it invades every little crevice of your life, and it takes over everything. and And it and it certainly didn't go the way that we we planned. And um, yeah, there began the kind of yeah, I, I was going to say roller coaster. Actually, there weren't really many ups. It was kind of just one continuous, you know, downward spiral, really. But but um, yeah, there it was. At what point did she? decide to start the podcast and think because I think that must have been a really big turning point in a way because at that point she's not shying from it at all and she is opening herself up to some really big life questions like regularly yeah she started a blog um uh, before I think it was a sort of journalist in Mm. it that kind of thought you know how best how best can I communicate this because she's getting asked you know daily by people what's going on how's your treatment going you know what's what's happening and I think it uh, first of all the blog was her was her kind of way of you not having to answer questions every day she just point people That's such to a the good blog idea. <laughs> yeah whether yeah. it be social media or whatever uh, you know just post a, uh, do a post every week mm. and yeah, that's the update and I think you know that kind of gave her the you know the realization that actually people were, you know were interested in her story and and um and then we so, we started talking uh, about the podcast actually uh, the two of us because at the time I worked at Five Live I was a producer at Five Live and and so I kind of had that that hat on a little bit and she had the presenting side on and match made in heaven <laughs> yeah we just kind yeah. of thought you know what could we do and 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 we kind of mapped out you know an idea and and it was almost for as much for her as it was for anybody else because it was you know that was her way of 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 uh, processing it when you're going to Rachel on here, when she was going you know through it all it was very easy to get you know quite doom and gloom quite down in the dumps when things weren't going well and actually when she talked about it on the podcast or or in a blog all of a sudden it made her kind of you know think about the two sides and think about you know it wasn't all doom and gloom she had to present you know a real mm-hmm. picture but also she had to you know she had to kind of think about um you know 
how it might go positively as well as how it might go negatively. And it kind of forced her to, you know, rationalize it a little bit in that way. So it was, um, it was, it, yeah, definitely as much for her as it was anybody else. And I think Five Live took a little bit of time to warm to it. Um, uh, John O'Wall, the former uh, controller, he, he, you know, he liked the idea, but I don't think he he was totally sold on it because uh, people just didn't talk about cancer back then. It wasn't, you know, say back then, it wasn't even that long ago, but there wasn't... It's niche. <laughs> there weren't really many podcasts or, you know, people would uh, didn't talk about it. So it took a bit of persuasion. Uh, but then, yeah, as soon as they started recording um, with Lauren and Deborah, uh, it was, you know, they just got on so well. And it just, like the interest and the, you know, the profile and the numbers were just going you know, uh, through the roof and it did very quickly. They found that a lot of people going, uh, uh, going through cancer themselves, you know, needed, you know, needed that in their lives to kind of, uh, make them feel a bit mm. less alone. And again, it's, it's not just the people that are going through cancer, but also the people around them, like yourself and like how, like me and Emma have experienced, you know, having a parent going through that. And I think it, it must, just provide so much support again it's kind of like how what this podcast does is just showing people that they're not alone in what they're going through and that is just yeah. invaluable isn't it and i just the same as what you said before really resonated with me about how the like cancer community on instagram has blown up and that is where we're seeing the power of social media so much and i think it must feel amazing for you to know that she has created such a lasting legacy like for goodness knows how long like this will be a way to keep her alive yeah. oh it's massive i got actually had a message uh, today from someone i get it uh, quite regularly just uh, this lady today just messaged me and say uh, uh, uh rachel was a big fan of the killers and this lady who i've no idea who she is she just messaged me and said uh, mr brightside came on on a car radio and she thought of rachel and it made her kind of oh. think of all the you know the impact that she made on her life so you know two and a half years on I'm still getting stuff like that, and and it's um yeah, it's, it's fairly remarkable, really. I I, I just kind of wish that she'd been mm. around to see it because it was, I mean, she yeah she recorded probably only only fourteen or fifteen, and since and since she died, we've gone on to make another probably fifty or sixty more mm. episodes, and and um you know she started it, and and she you know she is entirely the brains behind it, and and it's all about you know, we still try and make it in the same way that she wanted it to be. And, uh, but yeah, but she's not, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, not seeing the, the impact it, um, that um, she makes and it, and it makes as well. And I think, you know, with that podcast, I think it's the, the rawness and the realness of it. And, you know, like you say, you're all so open and honest on it. I think that is what makes it such you know, if it sounds weird saying this, but good listening because you're like, wow, yeah. these people, they're so outspoken. They, they're talking so openly about this. But obviously, you know, between yourself and Rachel, um, you will have had your own conversations and your own ways of dealing with things. And like you say, you had your little boy, Freddie. How did you manage that? What was that like? And what did you tell him? And what have you told him since? Yeah, in, I mean, uh, between us, you know, we were always really open. I mean, to the point of, of, of like too open, like, like <laughs> before she died, she wrote a book and, and you know, that, you know, that was the one that's too Freddie. Yeah. yeah. For Freddie it's called. And this is like, you know, seven months before she died and she's already writing mm -hmm. a book to her son from beyond the grave kind of thing. You know, if that's not enough to make you have some pretty honest conversations with yourself mm -hmm. and the people around you. I don't know what is, you know, we, we'd sit in bed in an evening i'd i'd read a chapter and just be like I, am i really doing this am i really reading you know my wife's book that she's that she's writing for our son it's it's it was it was pretty difficult and uh but you know we had some really tough conversations and i'm really glad that we did because um you know this is you know this is something this is what i've been banging on about for the last couple of years this is you know you guys know because you talk about it every week your death is going to happen to all of us. You know, obviously it goes without saying that it's heartbreaking when someone dies, but I just, we had so many conversations before she died that have made it an awful lot easier mm. for me um, since she died, an awful lot easier for me to know what she wanted for her funeral, what she wanted me to do with Freddie, you know, down to kind of how she liked his hair to be and, and like just 
there was never a conversation that you know we weren't afraid to have or were afraid to have sorry and um i think a lot of people they just you know put their heads in the sand and i yeah. and i understand that because it's difficult and it's a you know this is this is very hard stuff to talk about and and i understand a lot of it is kind of you know staring our kind of mortality in the face isn't it and and we don't really like to do that but but um you know the less we talk about it the more taboo it is and actually for Rachel she found it hard to talk about it to other people because they would just yeah. shut her down when she tried talking about it she was so open you know she'd talk about the fact that she was people gonna die. like oh no know, uncomfortable. You, people were like oh <laughs> you know what do I say I don't know mm. how to talk about this so they just mm. shut it down and it used to really frustrate her she's like I mean her mum you know bless her Rachel's mum is a wonderful lady and I can fully understand her you know, struggling to come to terms with the fact that her daughter was, you know, was dying. And at the time we didn't really know where, you know, whether it was going to be, you know, a month or yeah. six months or two years, but we knew it was coming. And I can remember Rachel getting really angry with her, just saying like, you know, mum, mum just let me talk about it. I'm going to die. You know, you have to accept it. And, and, and it was very difficult for her to accept. And I totally understand that, you know, I totally get that. But, but, but for Rachel, it was very difficult. So, as hard as it was for me, I I tried to, you know, engage with that as much as I could, and and and, and you know, have those honest conversations. And I'm, you know, like I said, I'm super glad that I did because it's it's made everything easier, mm. easier since. I think if you, you know, if you can have conversations like that, and 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 we had, like I said at the start, we had uh, nearly two years before she died while she's on treatment. You know, you you actually start the grieving process a lot earlier than the the moment someone takes their last breath you know it starts it starts well before mm. that and um uh you know i think that's all down to how how open she was and and, and how open uh, she forced us to be and that's kind of how i've i've tried to be with freddie as well you know we you know he was 14 months old when she was diagnosed so you know there's only so much of a 14 month old uh, uh toddler can get his head around but she, i mean he knew that she was ill he knew that um, you know, he didn't really understand cancer and, and that kind of thing, but we didn't really hide anything from him. We, I know people that um, when they've had their treatment for cancer, uh, because they've lost their hair or something, they've gone and stayed mm -hmm. with a friend uh, for two days while they've been ill, and then they come back home. You know, so the kids uh, didn't know mm -hmm. anything at all about it. Yeah, I mean, we were never like that. We just uh, sort of told him. I mean, like I say, fourteen months. You know, you can't really explain it to them, but. He, um, uh, when she died, I was, I was trying to think like the best way to do it. And like my, my reaction, I mean, my first reaction was to kind of, you know, uh, fluff it up a bit, you know, mummy's gone to live with Jesus or mummy's gone to live in the stars or something like that. And I it's read an, it's something. It's a natural instinct, I think, isn't it? To, you, you, want to, you want to protect it is, the child yeah. from. You want to protect. So. It is. It is. But actually the reality is that uh, all you're doing is you're, you're telling them that they yeah. they might come back, or even worse than them. that, you're telling them that there's a reason why they've gone, that they've they've left yeah. us, they've gone of their own choice. And and I spoke to somebody from uh, Winston's mm. Wish uh, charity, and uh, and she just said you just got to be really honest. You don't want to leave any ambiguity in there. So after she died, and, and she died in the middle of the night in the early hours, and and the, and the next morning I took Freddie into our bedroom, and he'd known that she had been had been there and been sick, you know. And I took him in and I said, "Mummy, you know, mummy died last night," and uh, and he burst into tears and, and then ran off and played with his how, toys. How you know, old was he at that time? Was he around oh. three? He was about a week before his yeah. third birthday. Wow. Um, uh, but it's um, yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty brutal conversation to have to have with a, a boy of of that. Well, of, I mean, any age mm. really, isn't it? It's, uh, but I, I I just didn't want him to you know i wanted to get it out of the way just rip the plaster off you know just didn't want to have any any ambiguity there and, and i think it's the same for anyone uh, like is like one of the things that was one of my bugbears is, is like the the phrase is like oh they've they've lost their parent or something and <laughs> it's funny because yeah, I, I understand it yeah. and i and, and i don't get an, annoyed about it per se but it is that kind of i'm more annoyed that people feel like they have to soften it when yeah. in reality death 
is brutal. Like death is not soft. It's not nice. Like it's a really hard thing. And I think we kind of soften it so much that we're so ill prepared for it. Um, and it's, yeah. it's scary. And kids are resilient. They're massively resilient, massively resilient. And, and he surprised me every day since he died. You know, he's, he's been, he talks about it all, oh, all the that. time, you know, he, and, and he talks about it in, he's, it's pretty clever, Freddie. He, he, he quickly realized that he gets out of trouble if he, <laughs> if he says, I'm just really upset because mummy died. So oh. he'll be, he'll be, he'll be being like a little, you know, a little mm. rat bag of a, of a kid, you know, misbehaving and, I'll be getting cross at him and he'll say, oh, Daddy, but I just really miss Mummy. Mm. And he knows that gets him out of trouble a little bit. But Heartstrings. Yeah. Like, yeah, well, yeah, not anymore. You'd like <laughs> he's lost his it's lost the impact that it's totally like the, lost the, the impact. The boy that cried no, now, isn't it? Like <laughs> oh, yeah. massively. You're so right though about all the language, you know, passed away mm. and, and you've lost your pet like you know, all that kind of stuff is because we don't want mm. to talk about it and and um, don't know if you guys have come across Catherine Mannix. Uh, she was a palliative no, care no. Uh, consultant. Uh, uh, she's written a book called "With the End in Mind," and it's it's a it's an amazing book all about understanding death. And I mention it every time I'm on a <laughs> podcast or on telly or radio or anything because it's just if if you're you know in this situation dealing with these things, it is just it is it's just the best book, and she's the best person to go to, or you know, follow her on Instagram, follow her on Twitter. Because in the last week of Rachel's uh, Rachel's life, I was texting her like every day, you know, what's going to happen next, you know, what's you know, what's going to happen yeah. to Rachel, you know, what should I do, how can I help? And I was just, I was just, I was just in touch with her all the time, and and um, you know, but I think it's it's difficult to do because we do like to put our heads in the sand, don't we? And and pretend it's not happening, but yeah. Unfortunately, it's the one. It's the one guarantee of life, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. It's a universal, universal inevitability. And I know even uh, Cat, the podcast, got some criticism, didn't it, for the name mm-hmm. because of the brutality of it, of being called the Dead Parent Club. Well, unfortunately, it's factual. <laughs> it's literally, it, it does what it says on the tin. You know that, that you don't need to dress up death because death is what it is, and it's going to happen to all of us. Um, I'm an, I'm interested. Um, Stephen, knowing how you navigated grief, not just your own grief, but Freddie's grief after that. You know, you mentioned then that he doesn't get away, mm-hmm. with, you know, playing the I'm missing mummy mm. card now. But did that change as time's gone on? How how did you cope with that? And also, how did you cope with then being his sole carer? Mm. It was something that, I mean, it's the sort of thing you can't really prepare for. I, I didn't really know what I was doing and I still probably don't. I'm just kind of <laughs> making of us up do, and go along to a degree. <laughs> Winging it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, who knows how to prepare for, you know, for what mm-hmm. we had to go through and, uh, you know, what so many people have to go through. You know, who 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 on earth can know what to do there? So I was fortunate enough that I didn't have to work for a little bit or for a, a year or two so I could take, you know, a bit of time off just to, you know, take time for me, but also take time to be around for him That's all the amazing. time. I mean, I'm still probably waiting for it all to come out of mm-hmm. him, to be honest, uh, to a degree, because he's he's only five now. He'll be six in September. And um, and he, you know, when they're two, three, four, they're not, you know, they, they're they resilient, but they're resilient because they yeah. don't really get it. You know, they can accept stuff because they don't really get it. Whereas I, I talk a lot to... um. Uh, Simon Thomas, you know, a, a former um, Sky mm. Sports presenter. His his wife Gemma died about a year before Rachel, and his his little boy Ethan's a little bit older than Freddie. He was he was I think he was nine or ten when Gemma died, and I think that was you know, that was a really hard age. I think because you you know you're at that age where you you have a lot of questions and you sort of understand it uh, mm. to a degree, but you probably don't you know can't quite get your head around it all. So um, Freddie was at a really good age in a way in that he was able to just accept it, you know, and, and just in a kind of a childlike kind of way. Uh, but the flip side was quite heartbreaking for Rachel. And it's why she wrote the book because, you know, he wasn't going to have his own memories of her. And that always, that always was, you know, always kind of ate away at her. You know, she, that's probably the thing that yeah. upset her the most. The fact that he, I mean, you know, in 20 years time, his memories will come from, 
uh, clips from the telly mm. and and uh, and audio clips and and the book and stuff. And we're lucky we've got you know we've, um, we're lucky we've got all those you know all those things for him. But it's um yeah it's pretty heartbreaking and 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 but like I say you know for him now and for me I guess as well it's it was a blessing that he was he was so young because it has you know, made life a little bit easier I think. I've spoken to a lot of people whose parents died when they were really young and they, they've they come onto the podcast in their 20s and they've said, this is the first time or this is, that I have ever spoken about my parent in depth. And like this person could have lost their yeah. mum or their dad when they were four, five and not spoken about them since. And I think the beautiful thing about his situation is that you are never going to be afraid of bringing her up and he's got all of this, mm. all of all of these resources available to him at his, at his fingertips. But is there anything in particular that you guys do, say like on the year anniversary or on a birthday or anything to kind of make space for those conversations? Because in day-to-day life, it, it can be quite hard to kind of make room for it. But yeah. on those kind of milestones, you kind of feel that, that need to kind of make a space where you can think about them. Um, for me, the anniversaries are a funny one. I think a lot of people, you know, we had a uh, in the week in a couple of weeks after she died, we had our wedding anniversary. Would have been about five days mm-hmm. after she died. Uh, sorry, was five days after she died, and then Freddie's birthday, and then it was it would have been her her birthday in January, it, it, and in between that we had Christmas. You know, there were loads Big of anniversaries, of loads of like milestones, and yeah, 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 yeah. and and and. And I kind of approach them all kind of the same. I I just can't. I think we can get like um, we can get very uh, worried about these things ahead yeah. of the time because we we have this like projection of what we there think is a lot worse like. than they actually are. Like the run up to them is so yeah. bad. <laughs> well, yeah, the run up yeah. is a lot worse, and that's because we're kind of expecting them yeah. to be really bad. And I I really tried the whole. That's what I've tried to do the whole whole way is not not decide how I was going to feel on any given day you know you try and just be the way you are and and I found that in the days after she died that I was expecting I was expecting to be curled mm-hmm. up in a ball you know unable to function for weeks and actually the day after she died um well actually the day the day she died five live uh had like they basically just dedicated the whole oh. day to her like they just did they just had they had people on all day they played clips they did everything and we sat in the garden laughing laughing and and smiling and and it wasn't at all how I yeah. thought I would feel and and that, that kind of like really affected me because I was like thinking you know am I allowed to be am I allowed to be laughing and smiling the day after my wife's died but actually you are aren't you and 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 it's and it's really important and I and I say this to Freddie now and I say this to anybody that'll listen you just got to feel the way that you feel and, and be okay feeling that way and I think uh, when it comes to anniversaries and, and and milestones, I don't, you know, I miss her hundred percent every day, <laughs> all the time. You don't miss her any more mm. on those days. You know, it doesn't go to one hundred and twenty percent because it mm. can't. You know, hundred percent is the highest. So, you know, I don't miss her any more on those days. So you just try and, you know, use those days as a as a you know excuse to kind of celebrate, excuse to, uh, you know, think of the good times, to raise a glass, to. You know, do some fun things, and uh, it, it, yeah, that's what we always try and do. Does that? As someone who has very little of my my mum, because in two thousand and eight, when mum died, like you know, the emergence of like video recordings <laughs> on your mobile phone, if you could do it, it was very grainy, yeah. and there just wasn't the thing. You just didn't really have it. Um, I wish, I wish I had some of those things that you had, like because you know, even. The ability to be able to hear Rachel's voice mm. or see the way she moves. Mm. It's like her movements and stuff. I'd, I was 18 when my mum passed away. And yet, weirdly, I struggle with my memories mm. of her. And a part yeah. of that, I think, is because I don't have that reminder. I don't have anything but written birthday cards or the occasional letter or note she'd written me um, as, a, as a reminder. So almost, weirdly, you're left forming another mum in your mind. Does that make sense? I know no, 100%. That sound weird, but... <laughs> Then you're not sure if those memories are actual memories or if, if they're pictures or, or exactly. someone's told you something. And no, no, we're so lucky. We're so lucky. I've said that, you know, a lot of times. And you know, we've got we've got, you know, all the podcasts, we've got all the all the all the five live clips, we've got, you know, a ton of 
you know stuff on social media we've got you know her phone is just completely <laughs> full of videos and yeah we've got you know loads and loads and loads of stuff so we do watch it from time to time freddie and i will you know we'll put something on or put a clip on and uh, we'll talk about her or or he, he's he's started to kind of want to get into her book a little bit you know her idea was that he'd read it when he was a little bit older perhaps in his teens you know early teens or something but well, there's a picture of when she had a car crash when she was in a in her late teens and she was like hurled at the back of a mini and she has her face is wow. all bashed up and and she's got like a bandage around her head and, and stuff and, uh, <laughs> and for some reason he always says can we see that picture of my mummy at the car crash <laughs> i don't really understand what that is it's something... so funny. <laughs> yeah psychological kind of you know study go you could do into yeah. that but i don't know um, what's going on there but <laughs> um and and since you know uh, Steve, you am I right in thinking you have a partner now? Um, mm. How how has that been for you? Because the one conversation I've never really been able to have, I've never been able to have a conversation with somebody who's lost a partner and grieved and continues to grieve and has found a new partner. I have never ever spoken. I keep to I keep waiting for my dad to get a new girlfriend or something. I'm like, it's, it's been well, six years well, now, Dad. <laughs> here we are. I can, yeah, I can make your dream come true. You, you, you talk to. Just like talk that. to that person <laughs> it's um it, it's something that i i was always fairly sure that i would do and, and and that's not like that's not that i wanted to move on or anything like that you know but i was just very i was just very determined that um determined that i would have you know a, a, an enjoyable you life it. And I would, everybody deserves it. i was only when rachel died i was 38 i was 38 i'm 40 now and um and you know, I mean, it, how depressing would it be if you decided that at thirty-eight you you're <laughs> done with, you know? And, uh, so I, yeah, very. I'm uh, I mean, even even before she died, we had conversations about it, and 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 she was very adamant. You know, she wanted Freddie to have you know mother figure in his life. Uh, she wanted me to be happy. Uh, that wasn't saying her. Uh, that wasn't her saying. You know definitely go off and do this but it was like whatever make you know whatever uh, way you you know you find to be happy and um and I think it's a it's a kind of thing that isn't you know it's very individual it's not it's not for everyone and I know people who you know 20 years after their partner's died mm -hmm. they've still got the wedding ring or or something and you know that's absolutely fine and 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 if that's what they want to do that's absolutely fine I was I was never going to be like that it, it, you know, my wedding ring uh, uh, went into a safe about six months after Rachel died. Um, you know, I mean, it sounds brutal, but we weren't married it's anymore. It's like quite a momentous you know, moment we when you took it off. Because I remember I, I would I would look at my dad's hands a lot after mm. my mum died. And, it, and I would always look and I'd always make a note as to whether it was there or not. And I was kind of had this thing inside where I was like, when he takes it off, that's when he's kind of ready to be not a married man anymore because technically he mm. he wasn't um it's like was that was that quite momentous for you yeah it was it was it definitely was but i think it was i'd been kind of on me and ahhing about it and I, i'd noticed that simon had taken his off at a kind of similar time to where i was you're not a similar time but a similar mm. time after your gemma had died compared to rachel and I messaged him actually. He said, "Whatever you do, don't put anything on social media." Because I think he, you know, he's he's always had a bit of stick for his, um, you know, the relationship that he's in, and 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 uh, I think a lot of people just mm -hmm. don't understand it. They just don't understand how you can. I've had it as well. You know, when I first put something on on social media about Amy, um, one of the newspapers uh, put um, uh, the headline was. Uh, something like um Rachel's husband um oh. uh, moves on just uh, 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 just what or like back on the market just what and the word just I, I emailed him I was like come on you know that's telling your readers that like, they should yeah. have a problem with this you know there should be you know, there's something wrong with this because to me there wasn't a problem with it whether it was you know, six months after or six years after it's, it's just sensa know, we're all sensationalizing aren't we? we're all, it aren't they it's just mm. And it doesn't, and it doesn't mean I, I love or loved Rachel any any less. It doesn't mean I miss her any less. It just means that, 
you accept that you know there's a life to live and there's and there's and there's fun to be had and there's and there's and there's a whole world out there to explore and to see and you know the worst the worst thing I could do for Rachel is to you know pack up and and give up because the reality is that I'm I'm the lucky one of the two of us you know I'm I'm the one who gets to carry on and enjoy mm-hmm. life. It's true. There is an element of that. You know, Rachel passed away. And then, you know, if you, it's like you say, it's pure personal preference, but you would kind of then be resigning yourself to a lifetime just waiting for your death then. Mm. If yeah. you'd have just, I mean, that's never going to happen. It, it, and that's important, actually, with, with Amy, uh, my uh, partner now, is that, you know, I'm I'm determined for it not to be a second rate version. You know, it's not, it's not, sec- you know, it's hard for her because, it's hard for her because there's Freddie and there's Rachel was so high profile mm. and so you know so loved and and, and so revered and it, it is difficult mm. for her. It's a lot of people focus on, you know, how hard it is for the person who's if the widow or the widower, but actually it's really difficult to date a widow or, or a widower. You know, it's really difficult and 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 I know it's not been easy for her and um um uh but. but but I, I always say to her, this isn't like, this isn't my second prize. This isn't, you know, this is, you know, this is going to be, you know, great in of itself. This is, you know, this is a a new thing that's going to, you know, that's exciting and it's, and it's. It's another main course. It's not, it's not, it's not just a dessert. It's another main course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not a, not a second class yeah. version of, of life. You're not settling for anything because um, of what happened. It's uh yeah, it's important to look at it that way. I Do think. you feel, Steve, that this has completely transformed your approach to life? Do you think your approach to life would have been completely different if Rachel hadn't been diagnosed, if she hadn't have died? Do you think this is completely just your outlook is completely different? I think it. I think it has to be, doesn't it? And actually, the the shame is that it takes mm. something like this to change yeah. your outlook on yeah. life, isn't it? You know, the shame is that actually it takes this kind of, you know, monumental, heartbreaking uh, um, uh, event uh, to actually make you realise that all those old cliches are true, that your life is so precious and, you know, it's not money and it's not mm-hmm. possessions and it's not all that kind of thing that's important. It's you know, it's people and it's experiences and it's and it's family and friends and all that kind of thing. And um, so, yeah, I, I I hope I am a little bit different. I hope it has... I hope it has had that effect because it yeah. should do, shouldn't it? It should, it should make you appreciate things a little bit more. It should make you less, you know, liable to get wound <laughs> up over little things that don't really matter. And I think it, I think it, I mean, for some people it might not have that, that effect, but I, I would suspect the majority of people, you know, would be changed by it. It was one of the biggest things that I learned from doing this podcast was that I never realised how positive the conversations were actually going to be. Um, when I first started yeah. it, I kind of thought, oh, you know, this might end up being a bit negative, a bit depressing. Like, oh, yeah. like, and people hear about it and they're like, oh, God, like that sounds really depressing. But yeah. the conversations that you have are so positive and so uplifting because people are changed by what happens to them. Yeah. And 95% of the time, it may be not at first, but with perspective and over time it people change positively that I know from my point of view that I much prefer the person that I am now to the person that I was before my mum died and yeah that has a bit to do with growing up with age but also it gave me perspective like I'm not as as like selfish (laughs) as I was before and (laughs) I love people so much more than I did before I value love so much more than I did so yeah I think it it is it's one of those kind of really cruel double-edged sword but yeah, yeah. But you've got to take the positives out of it, haven't you? You have to, you have to try and salvage, you know, whatever you can from this car crash that's happened in front of you, don't you? You have to, you can salvage like the way that uh, you react to it and kind of how it affects you and, and 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 how you are with people and how you don't worry too much if you know. I mean, Freddie is is a pretty messy kid, you know. Hurricane Freddie sweeps in, and I think if I'd have been <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I'd have been looking at the mess that he leaves, you know, five years ago, I probably would have been would have been a bit more bothered by it. But now you just say, mm. oh, whatever. It's well, it's a not a beautiful mess. mess. I'll, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't go so far as that. But <laughs> yeah. but it's just you just like, stuff like just don't, it doesn't matter, does it? You know, it's it's just it just doesn't yeah. matter. And 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 
you know, it makes you realise, you know, what is important and how lucky, we, you know, we are to be healthy and happy. And uh, you know, Rachel would have given her yeah. her right leg to you know, see Freddie grow up, and I get to do that. So how can I not be? How can I not be happy about that? Yeah. Mm. Can you share with us? please, a favourite memory of Rachel or, and just tell us about her. You know, there is so much that the world knows yeah. about Rachel because we all felt like we knew her because of everything she did while she was alive. But can you share with us Rachel to you? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Rachel, when I first met Rachel, um, she was this kind of uh, glamorous, I knew her from the Five Live office. I didn't actually know her, but I knew I knew of her because we worked in the same office. And you know, she was quite glamorous, and she was on the telly from time to time. And she did. I mean, at that time, she did quite a lot of telly. So, you know, very aware of who she was. And and um, you know, she came across like a little bit like um, aloof because she. But actually, realise uh, when you get to know her, she actually wasn't. You know, wasn't that confident and and um as as you know a lot of people in telly and radio aren't aren't half as confident as you think they are and and actually when you rachel one of the people that when you get under the skin you know she was like she was warm and she was kind and she was funny and she was um you know quite annoying at times could be like really 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 really, really <laughs> stubborn you know liked her own way um but you know it worked i mean it you know, we uh, we got engaged fairly soon after we met, probably only about a year after we met. Um, like three weeks after we met, um, she I found that I found this out only about a year after we'd uh, got married. But about th- three weeks after we met, she bet this friend of ours that we call Jaeger Ben because he loved Jaegermeister. Uh, uh, she bet Jaeger Ben four bottles of Jaegermeister <laughs> that we'd get married by the time the year was out. I mean, I, I, we'd only been together for a few weeks, and wow. um, and she was right. I mean, we yeah, we got married just over a year after we met, um, and yeah, the, the wedding was wedding was crazy big. You know, she was one of those girls who who just had it all all mapped out from when they were a kid. You know, just had had all the <laughs> you know the moniker from friends binders and all that kind of thing. You know, they all came out, and and, and, and you know we we'd argue over like what color the covers for the chairs had to be. And like because it all had to be, you know, absolutely perfect. Um, I've got a million memories of her. You know, she was just, uh, you know, she was just wonderful. But I guess like one of the, you know, one of the happiest or one of the uh, most kind of vivid would be, you know, when Freddie was born. Um, I think by her own admission, she probably, you know, might not have expected her. You know, had to sort of take to being a mum so easily and so seamlessly. But he was born by a cesarean because he was breech. He just wouldn't wouldn't turn, and and it, it ended up being a planned cesarean. And and literally from the moment that he was placed in her arms, she just knew what to do. Like she was just like just completely devoted to him. Just it it it, it, it was just. Mm. Yeah, it was just amazing to see you know, to see this uh, this person that, uh, uh, like I said, you probably wouldn't have, have imagined that she would have you know all those all those kind of skills. But you know, but just as soon as he was born, that was it. Like she was just like a duck to water, and um, and she was just uh, she just never had you know um, uh, could never have too much time for him. She was just always. You know, there for him, always playing with him. I've got these these beautiful videos of 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 them just doing painting together, and it's a five minute video. I don't know why it, it, it was Rachel's mum was videoing. I don't know why she let it run for five minutes, but it's five minutes of them just sat at a table painting <laughs> together, like just just doing you know doing nothing oh, really, that. but just chatting together and painting. And it's it's just a beautiful video, and it's mm, and so it's special. and it's just that kind of thing that that, that is so special. You know, when you think back, it's it's not um you know the big the big moments it's almost like the moments when you were doing nothing that's kind of what you miss most the you know you miss someone to uh, to do nothing with you know it's those it's those like little things that you mm. um that you miss so yeah you know that video of her painting is is just uh 
it's just yeah it's just beautiful so yeah we've got plenty to remember and 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 plenty to be thankful for and 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 freddie and i are and are very lucky so um yeah she was wonderful mm. steve thank, thank you. you thank you so much for sharing your story oh, with pleasure. us thank you yeah. um Thank you, and thank you so much for joining us on the Dead Parent Club podcast. Remember, you can reach out if you want to talk to us or if you've got any suggestions on areas that you'd like us to cover in the future. You can email us at hello at deadparentclub.co.uk or find us on Instagram at Club Podcast, and we're on Facebook and Twitter under the same handle. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.